Viewers who watch the Twilight Saga are usually divided into two camps, those who scold it for the unemotional Kristen Stewart and Too Sugary story, and those who idolize the franchise despite all its shortcomings. But there is something that both of them rarely think about. Namely, how did a melancholy indie film with a small budget suddenly make the whole world talk about it, considering the fact that even the studio didn't believe in its success? You are on the About Movies channel, and today we'll talk about the details and tricks that few people paid attention to, but thanks to which millions of viewers fell in love with Twilight. And also, we'll explain why it's fair to assume that the first part of the Twilight Saga is much better than all the next ones. Before we get started, click the subscribe button and bell for a better movie experience. We talk about your favorite franchises that most viewers don't know. If you rewatch all of the sagas, you find that all films are very different in content and visually. First of all, because they were filmed by different directors. In this video, we'll take a closer look at the very first film directed by Catherine Hardwick. It should be noted that she feels like a fish to water, making films about teenage rebellion, the complexities of puberty, and growing up. Two of Hardwick's best films are Lords of Dogtown, about the rise of skate culture, and Thirteen, about a young girl going wild. Hardwick admitted that she was lucky. Studios abandoned Twilight one after another, and Lionsgate bosses didn't expect special fees from the film. Therefore, they didn't get into the director's work. Hardwick defended the right to tell the story in cold tones, which, in fact, doesn't contribute to a big box office. And she filled the film not only with love language, but also with a fear understandable to any teenager not to fit into life and to lose mortal time. Her melancholy direction even ennobles the original text in the end. The first part of the franchise is surprisingly alive for a movie about vampires and werewolves. This is partly achieved through dialogue. From the very beginning of the film, Hardwick was looking for a way to make conversations more alive. In one of the first scenes, we can hear awkward and therefore reliable remarks about a person who didn't know what to say. It's a pretty good work lamp. The sales lady picked out the, the bed stuff. You like, you like purple, right? Another half a minute, awkward stomping on the spot filmed in one shot. It was done without any refined camera decisions, but with a very human visual intonation. Even more revealing was the dialogue of four people that followed this in dynamics. The camera movingly followed the heroine, the new characters, in an everyday way, forming a composition consisting of four people with father and daughter. Hardwick avoided static behind the close-ups of the interlocutors, the development of the missing scene, the camera didn't have to change position. Two characters were moved to the background, leaving the first to the young heroes. Hi, I'm, I'm Jacob. Hey. We, uh, we used to make mud pies when we were little. Right, no, I remember. <laughs> the continuation of the scene was just as organic. Bella and Jacob also moved into the cab of a car that her loving father had just bought for her from his Indian friend. In the frame, the characters are looking into details of the gift, and the viewer learns something about them along the way. Bella is the type to be excited about a sturdy farm pickup. Jacob is a guy with arms and happy to help. And importantly, it's much easier for actors to look like real people when their characters are doing something that real people can do in everyday life. With each subsequent film, the dialogues increasingly slip into a static exchange of remarks between characters who are placed on the frame like in a school theater. Bad theater. For comparison, in New Moon by Chris Wheats, the dialogues retain signs of life, but new spaces don't open up in them and in context, they are reduced to showing the suffering of the one who this time turns out to be the third wheel. For example, this flat picture is needed only to look at how hard it is for Edward to have Jacob's presence. On close-ups, the emptiness of the background, the lack of depth, begins to crush, and for the sake of a frame with this face, the heroes have been talking about nothing for almost half a minute. And to consolidate the effect, a gift against the backdrop of a sad vampire. The most dynamic dialogue in the film, even outwardly similar to the scene with a pickup truck gifted from Dad. Bella and Jacob are not standing opposite each other. They are busy with their work, fiddling with a motorcycle. A friend arrives and a joke brawl breaks out. But if Hardwick similarly left the characters in the forefront to get to know each other, Wheats ended the scene with a passing joke. I got five bucks on Quill. 
you're on. There are more and more dialogues with each film. In a car, at the stairs in a cinema, in the pouring rain, in a room, and on a walk. But even here, the camera hurries to stop and arrange the characters to show the most banal exchange of remarks in the most banal way. It's not that bad, but boring if it repeats over and over again. And even when some action is included in the dialogue, it doesn't become a full-fledged second plan. Even the background, the camera simply switches. Jacob speaks, Bella returns to the compact frame, and now you can alternate the discussed picture with the discussing heads. The same thing is in David Slade's Eclipse. A 180-degree rule is used in many scenes. In the two parts of Breaking Dawn by Bill Condon, the dialogue is usually a dozen people spread around the room dramatic attacks on the worried faces of speakers, and meaningfully silent ones. Heavy pauses, short remarks. Why? What did Irina say in the woods? We were just walking. Ness was catching snowflakes? Of course. The heroes of the saga love to talk. That is why the liveliness of the first Twilight is so striking. Compare at least this cute Jacob with that muscular puppet into which the authors of the following series turned him. Hardwick also devoted a large role to the image of nature. The surroundings of Seattle fit perfectly into the canon of Romanticism. Gloomy forests, ravines, light breaks through the branches, and the glades on which they lie. The lion and the lamb, that is, Edward and Bella. In this regard, it is worth remembering the very first shots of Twilight. Hardwick wasn't in vain praising the second director. The scene with the deer not only hints at good vampires hunting animals instead of killing humans, but sets the theme, hunter and prey. This footage shows the perfect leap from anxious observation to panicked escape. As befits vampires, the Cullens live far from people, in the forest, in a castle, but a very modern one. The Cullen House fits perfectly into the gloomy forest world. It's possible even to effectively enter it along a branch as it is part of the surrounding green space. For a while, the hidden danger of the forest works and finally dies in this scene from the second part of Breaking Dawn. It kind of picks up the beginning of the first film, but turns into a farce with predators jumping on the predator, which is justified in content, but rather stupidly made visually. The transformation of nature from an important element of the twilight world into scenery happens gradually. In New Moon, nature still retains the features set by Hardwick's film. However, the color correction has changed and the world is no longer so blue-gray. Yes, and the mosses aren't so thick and the memory about the glade has changed a little. Though the forest is shown with less magic, nature doesn't lose its semantic load. The truth is used more utilitarian. Here, the grass withered, there is no loved one nearby. And then, it gets worse. Just look at the forest and the glade in the eclipse. It is not quite a photo studio with photo wallpapers, but the picture is moving somewhere in this direction. In addition, the forest is now either cleared spaces for meetings or a backdrop for walking along. It's always somewhere behind the heroes. The camera doesn't go deep into it, but in Breaking Dawn, the forest appears almost only in the form of flickering trees. Perhaps all the nooks and crannies have already been cut down. The point, of course, is not the number of shots in the forest, and probably not even the picturesqueness of the corners chosen for shooting. The camera in the first Twilight, filmed by Hardwick, moves freely both in urban environments and in the thickets. This creates the effect of an animal presence, makes the forest and the characters in it breathe. As befits the heroes of romantic literature, Edward and Bella spend time in the woods with conversations and the camera constantly finds a way to get close to them, to accompany them even if not the most convenient for shooting, but visually advantageous spaces. Edward never sleeps, glows in the sun, and listens to Debussy, and also watches Bella and secretly sits by her bed at night. If he weren't the vampire in love from the novel, he would definitely turn out to be a homicidal maniac. It's unsettling that Bella falls in love with a handsome prince who acts like a toxic boyfriend to her, but Hardwick tries to make up for it by showing that it's not that Bella is a weak-willed person. As soon as she joins the team, she immediately fixes the relationships of her schoolmates. One of them, in vain, calls her to graduation. Non-refundable ticket. You should ask Jessica. I know she wants to go with you. Another one complains about the fact that the boy whom she likes is not calling her. I mean, you should ask him. 
Take control. You're a strong, independent woman. I am? Yes. Whenever Bella falls out of the activity of her school, time and time again, whether it's a prom talk or a gown pickup trip, it's safe to say she's acting like a teenage romance heroine cliché, withdrawn, misunderstood, and so on. But this is not at all the case. She is completely socialized. It's just that her emotional range does not coincide with her classmates. Oh, God. That is uncomfortable. Oh, it's disgusting. Bella, seemingly detached from everything, quickly and in an adult way, gives an unambiguous assessment of a fleeting incident because, in a sense, she is older. The more difficult it is to figure out how to enter into a humane film about a girl who has taken place as a person, a dialogue in which, for example, the following is pronounced. You sent... It's like a drug to me. And here, you are forced to remember that this is still not a conversational indie, but a film adaptation of a young adult novel about a schoolgirl who fell in love with a vampire, as if he's sprinkled with diamond dust. So the lion fell in love with the lamb. All the teenage characters in the first film act awkwardly, make long, unnecessary pauses, and look at each other too expressively. Do you think that actors constantly overact? Well, then you're in luck and your first teen crushes were different from what they usually look like. Although in those parts where Stewart and Pattinson really overact, the film still doesn't really interfere, because unlike the subsequent parts, the first Twilight is a film about love, not about vampires. The focus of the first film was on the characters rather than the fantasy universe of Meyer's novels. We were given only the most necessary information about vampires, without complicated layouts about the Volturi clan, etc. Even the whole werewolf line was untwisted only in the second film. Instead, we looked at how Bella and Edward's romance began, and several vampire fights only emphasized the character of the hero. The same goes for the action-packed baseball scene. It did a great job of revealing the world of vampires and getting us closer to the antagonists. The moment with the game is one of the most famous in the entire franchise. I wonder what scenes from Twilight you remember the most. Be sure to tell us in the comments. As the plot developed and the budget grew, thanks to the wild success at the box office of the first Twilight, the number of action scenes increased, the geography expanded, and new characters appeared. I get to meet any of Almond's friends. He likes to keep me hidden. Can't imagine why. And almost none of it helped. The more characters there are, the less time we have to develop them. There were many exotic allies in the second part of Breaking Dawn, and each of them was needed only as a carrier of their abilities. And what kind of people were they? They are just good. The expansion of geography was inevitable when it came to the Volturi, as they were the key antagonists of the saga. But how can you justify spending almost an hour in the first episode of Blossom filming a wedding and traveling in automatic mode? New Moon and Eclipse turned into an endless showdown of stalled relationships, interrupted by chases. But after the first movie, with its final showdown in a gothic cathedral ballet studio, only Edward's beating in Italy diversified the forest clashes involving giant wolves and head-opening vampires. The first film was focused on what was important for both the development of the plot and for the audience. None of the subsequent parts of Twilight managed to achieve such an effect, and because of this, all the imperfection of Meyer's original source, with all its bunch of ethical problems and the roughness of the game of young actors, came to the fore. Of course, they were in the first Twilight, but still, this was a movie of a different level that hooked the audience and ensured the success of the franchise. But most importantly, only in the first film, it was possible, only visually, to maintain a balance between the living world and the clumsy romanticism that bordered on it. The Twilight Saga is almost 15 years old now, but it still remains one of the most popular franchises of the 21st century with a huge fan base. It's even a little surprising that the producers have not yet tried to make more money on sequels, as they did in the case of The Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates is an example of how to ruin a great franchise. If you click on this icon here, you'll find out what was the secret of the success of the first parts and why the last films turned out to be so unsuccessful. Follow the link and watch. This was About Movies. Like this video to appreciate our efforts. Thank you for being with us and see you soon.